This really is a no-brainer, uh, according to Dan, who's probably here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Dan's. Um, thanks for uh, for this uh, uh, introduction. Uh, he says we uh, introduced AI to the product portfolio, um, and. Also, Dan hit on a few uh, key points, right, in, in this uh, short paragraph. So one thing that uh, he mentioned is the importance of data, right, to feed these uh, big neural networks. And uh, also Dan mentioned um, the um, uh, need to build confidence in these black boxes, right, so these neural nets. Uh, nobody really knows uh, what's inside. Um, so, and we actually do face that challenge when we uh, go talk to our customers, right? So our customers want um, confidence, right? They want to understand uh, what's, what's in the neural net. Um, so I'm gonna also address some of these, uh, these points, in particular the data and the confidence building in the, uh, in the later slides. So the way I interpret Dan's comment as it's a no-brainer um, is, is coming from the success of uh, machine learning in uh, some of the other fields, right? So um, Leo also talked about the applications in, um, in like uh, image and video recognition and self-driving cars and of course in, um, in playing uh, board games, right, like AlphaGo. Um, and these days, the requirements in accuracy and runtime for a Compolitho are so challenging, right? Every time I go visit a customer, um, I, I get told, you guys need a moonshot approach. You need to think out of the box, right? So, so the obvious question is, uh, can machine learning be the moonshot for us? And it turns out, uh, as Aki also mentioned earlier, we have been doing machine learning for a long, long time uh, in computational lithography. Uh, we just uh, use some uh, different terminology, right? So rather than um, training, we typically call it uh, calibration. Uh, rather than feature engineers, uh, we say model engineers. And rather than uh, model uh, features, we say model terms or uh, model forms. Uh, but essentially what we do is, is very similar, right, to, to some of these uh, machine learning activities in other fields. Uh, we have engineers uh, sitting at the desk uh, trying to come up with uh, models for either the optics or the resist. So one thing that is a little bit unique about our field is that um, our engineers have the blessing and guidance uh, from the pioneers um, in optical theory and resist chemistry, right? So uh, we have a little better leverage compared to some of the other fields who don't have physics as the guidance. So, so what's really different, right? So as, uh, as Leo also mentioned earlier, uh, deep learning is actually what's brought out the, uh, the latest uh, revolution in, uh, in machine learning, right? So uh, one difference is instead of the manual feature extraction, uh, with deep learning, you just throw a whole lot of data at this neural network and train the neural network and then these uh, feature classifiers or autoencoders, they would emerge, right, just based on the training data. Um, and this has advantage in the performance of the network. It has advantage in terms of uh, reducing the amount of uh, uh, human labor. So, um, so we wanted to give it a try, right, for, uh, for the uh, model calibration problem. Um, which is, is really a very uh, classical um, application of uh, supervised learning. So this picture came from uh, Google. Um, so the message of this picture is that uh, with the deep neural networks, um, when you don't have a whole lot of data to feed it, right, so because there are so much uh, degrees of freedom in the deep neural nets and you don't have enough data to constrain the parameters, uh, you can get very good fitting, but the prediction results are usually bad. So you suffer from uh, overfitting. So, so that's why when you don't have a lot of data, deep learning is actually uh, even um, uh, worse in terms of the uh, prediction accuracy compared to the traditional approach. But once you reach a certain threshold and you keep increasing the amount of data, then uh, the performance of the deeper neural nets keep rising and they saturate at a, a much, much higher accuracy level compared to the uh, traditional machine learning. 
so we try to test this uh, with a uh, real uh, uh, model calibration job. And uh, so here uh, the vertical axis is one over model error, uh, which is not a typical way we, we do these plots, but uh, for a visual comparison, uh, we plotted the inverse of uh, model error as an indication of accuracy. So higher means uh, um, better accuracy. And on the horizontal axis, we uh, list the number of uh, calibration gauges. And as you can see, uh, the traditional uh, uh, model was saturated at this level, uh, but the uh, deep learning model um, keeps uh, the uh, performance gain when you had uh, more uh, data added to the training. So uh, what would uh, be a good data source? Uh, so I'm here uh, going to um, talk a little bit about uh, eBeam. Um, so traditional CD-SAM, you have a one by one micron square uh, field of view. And uh, with the uh, fast eBeam from uh, uh, HMI or Hermes Microvision, uh, the field of view is, uh, is 12 by 12. So this is uh, uh, just a, a lot a lot bigger in the field of view, and also it provides an advantage in terms of the um, uh, throughput, right? So this is comparing uh, the area throughput um, of a traditional uh, CD-SAM versus EP5 with small field of view and EP5 with a large field of view. And here you see the uh, precision uh, of the measurements uh, from uh, EP5, uh, which is sufficient for uh, metrology purposes. Um, and this slide uh, is a uh, uh, preview of what's going to be shown uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning in the uh, metrology session. Uh, this is uh, joint work uh, between uh, SK Hynix and ASML, showing the benefits of uh, deep learning and fast eBeam and big data. Right. So uh, this bar shows the uh, uh, model error. Um, from the baseline metrology and baseline model without uh, deep learning. And by adding a lot of uh, um, CD and edge placement gauges, which is really the contour points from EP5, um, we reduce the model error by about a third. And then by further changing the model form uh, from the traditional model to a deep learning model, we get another 18% gain in accuracy. And all of this uh, was done with actually less metrology time uh, due to the uh, fast uh, throughput from the EB, uh, EP5. And uh, we have applied this methodology to multiple uh, customer test cases. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the uh, results comparing deep learning versus uh, traditional model uh, for both DPUV and EUV for uh, advanced logic nodes, seven and five nanometer. Um, and here, um, so like, uh, like Leo said earlier, the, the benefit that we have is we can actually generate a lot of uh, training data. Uh, so Leo talked about uh, the uh, simulated environment using virtual reality. And in our case, uh, we can start with a physical model that was pre-calibrated and use that to generate lots and lots of simulation data uh, based on the input layout, right? So um, here, uh, this would bring uh, more stability to this neural net. Um, and the actual wafer data from, uh, from uh, EB metrology uh, would be the anchor points. Uh, so in our fitting, we put less weight on this data and higher weight on this data. So we get the benefit of both stability and accuracy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, runtime, right? So uh, uh, Harry talked about all the computational challenges in uh, EUV comp litho. And um, in fact, if you just uh, look at the optical resolution of EUV versus uh, ARF immersion, uh, just do a simple calculation of uh, lambda over NA comparison, you would see that uh, to cover the same area, you would need 12x more pixels with EUV. And combine that with all the other challenges that, uh, that Harry mentioned uh, and the need to do uh, full field OPC, um, uh, the, the amount of computation just explodes, right? So here, uh, we show the uh, progression of 
uh, the uh, uh, transistor density and with five nanometer, uh, five nanometer node, uh, we're looking at uh, over 10 billion uh, transistors per centimeter square and the number of critical masks uh, also rises. And um, the OPC runtime on a per unit area basis uh, keeps rising and this is uh, our estimate of the total amount of uh, computing power uh, dedicated to OPC worldwide. So it's on the order of uh, 10 petaflops. If you add it all together, uh, it's uh, within the top 10 of the uh, uh, world's uh, supercomputers. So. Um, to be able to control the runtime, right, has direct benefits to our customers uh, because here runtime, you know, longer runtime means more hardware, more cost, and uh, longer uh, turnaround. So, um, what do we do with uh, deep learning then? Uh, so the idea is, again, uh, we can uh, make very good use of this uh, simulated environment or this uh, sandbox. Um, so. On the top, on the training flow, right? So we start with a small number of uh, selected clips and we run the complex iterative algorithm, right? So this could be uh, inverse OPC, ILT, or it could be even conventional OPC. And we train a neural net uh, to capture the transformation uh, from the training input to the uh, um, to the uh, to, to the mask image. Um, this algorithm is, is very, very slow, but then we apply to the full chip this pre-trained neural net, right? So um, on the full chip level, uh, we achieve a huge uh, runtime benefit. Um, so typically the way it works is this neural net may not be perfect. It doesn't hit the, uh, the best OPC, um, but it gives you a very good starting point. Uh, so even in conventional OPC, we see benefits from uh, this approach and uh, um, it can uh, reduce the uh, runtime uh, uh, very significantly. Uh, so this morning there was a talk by uh, Chang Xin. Uh, so uh, this this is the work that we did with uh, with Chang Xin on um, using deep learning to uh, to apply sub-resolution assist features. Uh, we, so one key challenge is the pattern coverage. So we have a uh, methodology to select representative patterns uh, using uh, again a machine learning approach. Um, to do uh, clustering and uh, selection of uh, representative patterns, and we compare the performance of this uh, systematic method um, versus some of the other approaches uh, like manual selection or, or uh, random selection, right? So here, uh, this is looking at the, uh, the normalized uh, RMS, so between the neural network prediction versus the ground truth. And we see the benefit here. And also, uh, if we look at the uh, PV band data uh, with these various approaches, uh, this uh, systematic method also beats uh, random selection and manual selection. So what does this mean on mask and wafer? So this is uh, uh, one clip uh, that we selected. Uh, with uh, traditional uh, or rule-based uh, SRAF, uh, we have some uh, simple placement of SRAF. And at uh, about 40 nanometer defocus, we actually see some necking uh, for, for this uh, whole pattern. Uh, but with the deep learning uh, SRAF placement, there's some extra corner bars, as you notice, uh, which would be quite difficult to, to program with, uh, with rules. And also the necking is, is gone. And on the full chip level, we saw a 24% increase in depth of focus. So, yeah, this is a summary to just look at various aspects of uh, technologies, right? So um, on the computational side, uh, we have uh, development efforts in uh, inverse OPC, and uh, we're also uh, starting to look at uh, potentially making use of other computing architectures uh, such as uh, GPUs. Um, and as, as Leo talked about, uh, NVIDIA uh, leads the pack in terms of uh, application of GPU in uh, AI and machine learning. Um, but we're also very interested in the uh, roadmap of Intel, right? So for us, um, it would be very beneficial if a single chip uh, can provide both the traditional uh, computing and AI uh, either training or, uh, or inference. Uh, so last year, Intel announced the uh, Cascade Lake, 
which had a uh, embedded deep learning processor called the Intel DL Boost, um, and we're uh, keeping our, our eyes on, on the uh, upcoming Cooper Lake, uh, which, as we understand, uh, would have uh, floating point support, uh, more precision, and uh, also better support for, uh, for training of, uh, of the neural nets. And one benefit we see potentially is, uh, is reduced overhead in terms of a communication, right? So uh, if a single chip can perform all these calculations. Um, and of course, uh, also as uh, the previous speakers talked about, uh, the multi-beam mask riders are available, are ready. Uh, the inspection infrastructure is available. So uh, all of these uh, factors combined together, uh, we see uh, a great opportunity to meet the um, uh, cost and runtime and accuracy requirements for the future nodes. <coughs> Uh, so I have a couple slides to show the application of uh, uh, machine learning in the fab space, right? So we uh, talked mostly about uh, the, uh, the data prep or, uh, or OPC side, um, but we're also developing some new applications uh, in the fab, right? So what we're seeing here is the history that a wafer goes through, right? So with the various uh, equipments, um, litho, edge, uh, CMP, deposition, and um, what we would like to do is to feed all the context data or the history data for a particular wafer to our platform called Litho Insight and run machine learning to find patterns and uh, do smart grouping and then um, do a feed forward correction uh, at the next uh, Litho step on the scanner. So this work was uh, published, uh, I think, a year ago at uh, SPIE here. Uh, and in, in the interest of time, I won't go through the details. But the idea was to do a, a decomposition of these uh, overlay fingerprints and correlate these fingerprints to the wafer context. right? So, um, and then capture that in a uh, machine learning model uh, to, to perform a feed-forward control. And here's the results. Uh, this is a cumulative uh, histogram of the um, uh, number of uh, wafers versus the, uh, the overlay, right? So, and with machine learning, we get a 5% uh, increase in terms of uh, wafers in spec. And then uh, a bit of an advertisement for uh, my colleague, Emil. Um, he is going to talk about uh, machine learning for metrology at 140. Um, so his idea is that we have very dense measurements of uh, leveling data. Um, and we also have sparse measurements of overlay or alignment. Um, then the idea is to build this machine learning model, uh, which is also a deep learning uh, neural network, to predict the uh, overlay or alignment based on the leveling data, effectively increasing the density of available um, data for, uh, for overlay or, uh, uh, or alignment. And uh, you'll be welcome to, uh, to attend this talk at uh, 140. Um, so in summary, right, so we see uh, the, the ASML holistic triangle uh, in terms of uh, lithography scanners and also working with uh, partners in, uh, for example, uh, etching and deposition and uh, data provider uh, from scatterometry like EOSTAR or SAM, like the EP5, and also connecting to uh, context data from uh, other fab equipments and uh, also algorithm efforts in the, in the physical models, in the optimization, and uh, in, uh, in machine learning. Right? So this creates a feedback loop. So uh, the metrology data feeds new algorithms, and new algorithms uh, um, enable new applications, which in turn generate uh, even uh, more data. So it turns out uh, this kind of a feedback between uh, applications, data, and algorithms is uh, the cornerstone of many uh, internet companies, right? So companies like uh, Google and Facebook, they all rely on this business model uh, to generate more data, to drive smarter algorithms, and to, again, uh, establish a, a strong uh, entry barrier uh, for their competitors. Um, and 
not only that, we see this kind of a feedback loop in, in the whole world, right? So in the whole computing world, on uh, the new applications and data and, and algorithms, right, being uh, enabled by, uh, by Moore's law. And uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you.